going to jump right into it this morning. Um, we're going to talk about an interesting topic that a lot of us don't talk about in church. Um, interesting topic, interesting topic. See, if you can close that door, that'd be great. Um, we're going to talk about this concept of vengeance. Can somebody say vengeance? Vengeance, vengeance. Now, vengeance is an interesting, interesting, interesting subject matter. And the reason why is because a lot of us in here like to get even with people. Can we be honest? Oh, just me? Okay. <laughs> me and Miranda. Okay. So me and you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to amen each other because not everybody's going to be honest this morning. Um, if we can keep it 100, okay, many of us want people to get what's coming to them when it comes to how they've mistreated us. Can I get an amen? So whether this is with your spouse, okay, I won't get any amens from the husbands, but it's okay. So, you know, you feel that your spouse is in the wrong. Your spouse did you wrong. You want to get them back, okay? Now, you probably won't amen that, but the reality is just as petty as little kids are on the playground, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, that's mine, no, uh-huh, I'm a tail. We still respond that way because of the fact that you are only as old as your last undealt with hurt. I'll say that again. You wonder why your spouse, your friend, your significant other acts like a child when conflict arises. It's because psychologically, when we encounter a problem that reminds us of the problem we dealt with as a child, we resort back to reasoning and rationalizing like we did as a child because we never dealt with that pain. Psychologists have studied that and have come to the point, which is why most of us that go see psychologists, I've seen a, a psychologist before, help me process life. It always goes back to your childhood. This is why adults can get into some of the most vindictive dialogue, angry, yelling, punching, domestic violence, and then some. But it's not just for married couples or people who are dating. This boils over into how we respond to our children. See, when you have undealt with pain, you can take it out on your children. Lashing out, punishing aggressively. I used to do that. My wife had to check me and I had to pray because I would respond to my children doing some of the smallest things, yelling. And after I went and prayed about it, my wife would, would correct me. I had to realize that I was doing some things that I had seen done in my home and that wasn't necessarily the right move. So today we're going to talk about vengeance. Vengeance. Somebody say vengeance. And here's our, our main point for today. If you're taking notes, if you're tweeting, if you're writing down. Here's our main point for today. Because we have been forgiven, we must forgive. Because we have been forgiven, we must forgive. The dictionary defines the word forgiveness as the ability to let go of angry feelings toward another. It's to grant someone relief from a debt they owe you. Oh, I'm going to say that last one again. To forgive someone is to grant someone relief from a debt they owe you. Now, if we can be honest, <laughs> a lot of us cuss people out over $5. <laughs> I got family members that don't talk to each other because they owe each other a couple dollars. Today, we're going to look in the Bible, and God is going to use a metaphor of owing someone finances and correlated to forgiveness. Let's take a look in the Bible, shall we? If you have a copy of the Bible, you can open up to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, we're going to start at verse number 21. We're going to expose this text. This is expository preaching this morning. We're going to go verse by verse, and we're going to see what God is saying about this concept of getting back. Because... If it's just a few of us in it that's going to be honest or watching this online or listening to this online, most of us struggle with letting go of what you owe. Let's see what God does. Matthew chapter 18, verse 21. I have the new, the new international version. It says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, 
How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? That's a good question. <laughs> Up to seven times? That's a good question. Now, what you got to, let's pause right here. What you have to understand is that most rabbis in, in, the, in, this, in this day and age and the scripture that was read, it says that all you have to do is forgive somebody seven times. Most of y'all wish that was what God required of us, right? Seven times, I'm counting down. Five more times and I'm out of here. Okay, so back in the biblical days, rabbis that practiced Judaism taught that you just needed to forgive someone seven times. So Peter, like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to ask him, you know, watch, I'm going to ask the master. How about, uh, how, how much should I forgive somebody? Seven times? Peter thought his brown nosing was going to get him some points for Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, Actually, let me rephrase that. I apologize. It wasn't seven times. It was about a little less than seven times. So Peter asking for seven times was like trying to get an A+. Plus. Here's what Jesus said. Look at verse 22. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but what? Seventy-seven times. Seventy-seven times. Seventy-seven times. Now, get this. But you got to understand... <laughs> is that that means 70 times 7. That's how it translates in the Greek it was written in. That's 490 times to forgive somebody. Now, some of y'all are like, okay, God, let me, let me get my calculator out because uh, you lied, you cheated, you ain't come home on time, mm -hmm. you looked at her butt, okay. That's two. Um... <laughs> so if most of us were tallying, we would get to 490 pretty quick. <laughs> we get to four. You can yell, you you had 439. Oh yeah, oh, 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 you had 488. All right, come on now. Come on, Rollo, one more time. And so before we know it, we would be looking for the sin so we can have an excuse to leave. But what Jesus is saying when he says the, rigid, the, the exact translation is 70 times 7, what Jesus was saying was not simply to just do 490 times to forgive someone, but to go far beyond what you think you should forgive a person. You think you should only forgive somebody seven times? Go far beyond that. Let's keep reading. Look at verse 23. Jesus gives us a little story to help this make sense. Therefore... The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Look at 24. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Now, before we go any further, let's break down how much money this guy um, owed. 10,000 bags of gold. Okay. The bags of gold were called talents. Everybody say talents. One bag of gold weighed about 75 pounds. The first servant owed the king 10,000 gold boulders that weighed 75 pounds each. Somebody say debt. You thought you owed Sally Mae. <laughs> This dude is in debt beyond debt. He owes the king millions. Millions. Let's look at the scriptures. <clears throat> Verse 25. Since he was not able to pay the master, I'm sorry, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. 26. At this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. Now let's stop right there. Have y'all ever had somebody that owe you money and they tell you that line? Yo, just, I need a little more time. You know what I'm saying? Because, like, I know, but I'm saying, you know, my money is tied up because I got the savings account. And, you know what I'm saying? You know, my money is overseas. I mean, I made a bad investment deal. If you, you know, don't put no interest on it, man, I can pay you back in like two years. If you put interest on that 50, man, I mean, I can't cover that. But if you just let me owe you 50 in two years, we good. 
A lot of us have people that owe us money, and they give us that same line. This dude owed a king millions. Let's see what the king says. Let's look back at the scripture. <laughs> 28. But when that servant, I'm sorry, <clears throat> 27. The servant's master took what? Pity on him. Canceled the debt and let him go. Now, you don't let people go for $20. <laughs> you will not talk to them at the family reunion. You will not go see them. You will not say a word to them. There's some of us, we have beef with our family members. We got brothers and sisters that owe us money, uh, borrowed our car, put a scratch on it, or uh, took something. Man, you ain't never getting my DVD. All my DVD, I'll be buying, let you buy my DVD. You ain't never get my DVD back. Now, they was all bootlegs. But still, I had my shoppies on them. You knew it was mine. And we let the littlest things keep us from forgiving. So the king had every right to throw that man in prison, take his wife and children, make them slaves. Dude said, have mercy, take pity. King said, all right, man, I'll let you go. Let's see what happens next. 28. But when that servant, that same first servant, went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Hmm. Let's see what he does. Did he forgive him? Did he take pity on him? Actually, he choked him out. Y'all thought choking people out was something new. Let's look at the Bible. No, it's been going on for a while. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me. It seems kind of weird, doesn't it? Let's see what else happens. This first servant owed somebody 10,000 bags of gold. Walked up on a dude that owed him 100 silver coins. Choked him out. Let's break down how much he owed. Here's the difference in the money that the first servant owed the king. Let's do some math. We're going to put it on the screen. <clears throat> the silver coins that the second servant owes the first servant are called denarii. It's plural. <clears throat> of the word denarius. A denarius is a Roman silver coin worth about $60 each. So let's do the math. You take $60 times, <laughs> excuse me, 100 coins. He owed the first servant about 6,000 US dollars. Some of y'all would probably choke somebody out for that too, right? I mean, this be out there. I need that 6,000, boy! That's a lot of lottery tickets, you know. You can get big, but you get 6,000, you hit every number there is. You play every birthday, you know, never mind. So he owed, the second, er, the second servant owed the first servant $6,000. Okay, I did the math for you, see? But now let's do the math of how much the first servant owed the king. <sighs> the first servant owed the king 10,000 talents, okay? The talents... <clears throat> When you do the math, it's 6,000 times 10,000 because the way, like, the minimum wage was, you know, a talent a day, and you do the math from ancient Roman numbers, and you come up with about, hmm, let's put it up, 60 million. That's, that's not a lot, right? I mean, <laughs> you could be pardoned for 60 million, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the first servant owed the king 60 million. King said, go. Dude that just got pardoned from 60 million goes out and see a dude that owed him 6,000 and start choking him out. Sounds like us, doesn't it? God has forgiven us of so much, but when somebody does us wrong, we give them hell. We want justice, but God didn't give us justice. He gave us mercy and grace. You know how I know you got mercy and grace? Because you're right here breathing right now, which means you got time. If you're watching this online or you listening to this online, you're still alive. You got time. But the clock has ticked out on some people. And we need to remember our main point for today. Because we have been forgiven. Because we have been forgiven, ladies and gentlemen, we must forgive. Let's look back at the scriptures. Let's see how this story ends. 
Verse 29, the second servant, the second servant, yo, the second servant got on his knees. This looks familiar, right? <laughs> second servant got on his knees and said, yo, be patient with me. I'm going to pay you back that 6K, yo. That's six stacks. I got you. 6,000, I'll pay you back. I promise. Look at 30. The first servant refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. 31. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that happened. Now, what y'all think the king going to do? Let's see. 32. The king, the master, called that first servant in and said, that's what's up, man. You're supposed to choke a dude out. Yeah, boy. Is that what he said? The king said, you wicked, wicked servant. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is a scary verse right here. 35. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you. Unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Now. Some Bible scholars don't agree on what verse 35 means. It's, it's, it's really a, they don't agree. Some think that in the story, the king is one Christian brother to another. And like, yo, you got to forgive your Christian brother, you know. Um, but other Bible scholars believe that the king represents God and you and I represent the servant. Now, I'm going to challenge your theology or your study of God for a moment. I know that according to the Bible, you are not saved by what you can do. You are not saved by works. You cannot earn your way into heaven. Amen? Salvation is a free gift that comes by faith in Jesus Christ. Yet, verse 35 is in the Bible for a reason. Let's put 35 up. There it is. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. I want to err on the side of caution and be as forgiving as I can. Because although I know I'm saved and I put my hope and trust in Jesus, verse 35 tells me if I don't forgive my brother and sister from my heart, God's going to have a hard time forgiving me on judgment day. You read that? Look at that. Look at it. God canceled your debt. Sinner, liar, thief, drug abuser, murderer, sexually immoral, cheating on your spouse in your mind, in your heart, or in the physical, a backbiter, a gossip, a coveter. You've broken the Ten Commandments. You deserve to go to hell. God saw your mess. You prayed a prayer of salvation. He wiped your debt clean, forgave you of all the evil you've ever done to offend him. You walk out of church and you can't forgive your brother. You can't forgive your parent who hurt you when you were a child. You can't forgive your spouse. Jesus says, how can the love of God truly be in you? If you don't show it to those who hurt you, because you hurt me. The Bible says in Hebrews, when we sin, it's like we're putting Christ all on the cross all over again. Jesus took the beating that you deserved. So you could be free. Should you not let others free? We're going to close out with this verse here. And we'll be done. You can put it on the screen, Brandon. <laughs> the next passage is Romans chapter 12. What should we do, Devin? Romans 12 gives us the answer. Romans 12, 17 says, 
do not repay anyone evil for what? Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Let's go to 18. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at what? Peace with everyone. Last verse. Do not take revenge. Do not take revenge. Why? Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. Here's our problem. We don't have any room for forgiveness because our heart is full of vengeance. God says, step out of the way. I'll get that get back. Because anybody who offends you or hurts you ultimately hurts God. Every sin that's ever committed is always against God at the end of the day. They may have cussed you out, but at the end of the day, they offended God. They may have stolen money from you, but at the end of the day, they offended God. David wrote in one of the Psalms, against you and you alone have I sinned. Hold up, dog. Your sin caused all of Israel to get beat down. Thousands of soldiers got killed. Nah, nah. Against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. We have to understand that God is more offended than you are. The person that hurts you. The person that negatively speaks about you. The person that took advantage of you. And God says, I'll get that get back in my own time. Here's how we should apply this message to our lives. Do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. This morning, I want to pray for some of us who struggle with forgiveness, letting things go. A famous quote says that holding on to unforgiveness is like you drinking poison and expecting the person to get sick. Unforgiveness and bitterness boil up and fester. Some of us in here who are single parents have had some troubles with our child's father. And so we store up so much bitterness and angst against that child's father or that child's mother to the point that that unforgiveness eats us up where we don't even function properly when their name is mentioned or when they come in the room. You have given too much power to someone who hurt you. Because when we hold on to unforgiveness, it ultimately causes us pain, and it leaves no room for God to do what he wants to do. I want to lift up a prayer for those of us in here today who struggle with that. We can bow our heads and close our eyes. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, God, we ask that you would help us in the areas of unforgiveness and bitterness. All of us in one way or another deal with resentment, hurt, pain, from a spouse, from a brother, from a sister, from a family member, from a coworker, from a teacher, from a friend, from somebody in the neighborhood, to a stranger that bothered or offended us on the road. We deal with vengeance thinking on a regular basis because none of us love or like to be offended. God, would you help us, Lord, to remember that because we've been forgiven so much, we too should forgive. Would you help us, Lord, to remember what you have done for us on the cross? If you can keep your eyes closed and your head bowed, if you're in this room today and you didn't realize you offended God, I have some bad news for you. God has forgiven the sins of those who have become his children. But the way to become one of God's children is to admit that you have a problem. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you're in this room and you don't know that you need salvation, the bad news is that you have offended God. You have a debt that you cannot pay. 
The only way to pay for it is to spend an eternity in hell. You may say, Devin, what did I do to get this debt? How have I offended God? Why well, need his forgiveness? The Bible says in the Ten Commandments in the book of Exodus, there's God's law. And the Bible says if you've broken one of God's laws, you deserve to go to hell. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. That means have sex outside of your own marriage. Have you ever looked at somebody lustfully that you wanted sexually? Have you ever had a sexually explicit thought about somebody who's not your spouse? Have you ever masturbated to pornographic images? If so, you deserve to go to hell. If you've had sex with someone who's not your spouse, you deserve to go to hell. The Bible says, thou shalt not lie. If you have ever told a lie, even a little white one, if you were playing and said psych, you deserve to go to hell. You may think that's petty. No, it's just that God is holy and you wanting to justify that shows how sinful you are. I can go down the whole list, but I'll do one more. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. Have you ever talked back to your parents? Have you ever sucked your teeth when they told you to do something? The moment that you sucked your teeth or did not do what they told you to do when you were supposed to do it, you should have been struck down and sent to hell because you have offended a holy and perfect God. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the bad news. But today, I also bring good news. 2014 years ago, God came in the form of a man known as Jesus Christ, 100% God, 100% man. And he loves you so much that he died on the cross for your sins, that if you would put your trust in him this morning, the Bible says you could have eternal life. You would be saved. Saved from what, Devin? Saved from the judgment that you deserve. Saved from an eternity in hell. If you're in this room with every eye closed and every head bowed, and you say, that's me, Devin. I need this salvation. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I know I've offended God. I need help. Would you raise your hand that I might pray with you? I won't ask you to do anything weird. I won't ask you to come down. I won't even ask you to stand up. I want to pray with you so that you can do what the Bible says that we must do to be saved. Amen. I see your hands. God bless you. God bless you. I see your hands. God bless you. You may put your hands down. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You cannot earn your way into heaven. When I speak to people of other religions, they believe they can earn their way into heaven. I spoke to Jehovah's Witnesses this week. They think they can earn their way into heaven. They think they can earn their way into paradise. I speak to Muslims on Benning Road. They tell me that they hope their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds when they stand before Allah. Ladies and gentlemen, you can never give to enough charities. You can never do enough good things to please and satisfy the wrath of God. Because at the end of the day, every good thing that you think is good is still wicked because you're doing it apart from God. The only thing that will satisfy the debt you owe is Jesus Christ paying the price for your sins. If you raise your hand, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. The power does not come in you repeating after me. The power comes in your confession, in your belief. You must confess your mess. I tell this story often. When I was in my early 20s, I went on Andrews Air Force Base and I made a wrong turn. I ended up near Air Force One. I did not realize I made a wrong turn, but I broke the law and military police jumped out with their assault rifles and took me into custody. And I stood before a judge on Andrews Air Force Base. I was facing five years in prison and a $25,000 fine. I was charged with treason against the United States government because I made a wrong turn. I had no idea I was guilty. Maybe that's you. Maybe you didn't know you offended a holy and perfect God, but now you know. And when I was there in court, before they passed sentencing, I didn't be cute and cool. I threw myself on the mercy of the judge and begged for mercy. Would you do that now? You who raised your hands or you who wanted to raise your hands, right now, would you talk to God in your seat? I was trying to get out of five years in prison. I'm talking about an eternity in hell. Would you confess your mess? Would you talk to God right now and confess 
the evil that you've done. Confession is not about you telling God something he doesn't know. He knows what you've done. Confession means you want him to do something about it. I have two sons. When one son offends the other, one son will run and tell me, Daddy, he hurt me. Why? He acknowledges that I can do something about it. Would you talk to your spiritual daddy right now and tell him what you've done? God, I'm evil. God, I'm a liar. God, I'm sexually immoral. God, I'm a thief. God, I need your salvation. Would you take a few more moments to confess what you've done to God? Even though the lights were off, he still saw you. But you confessing means you want him now to do something about it. Take a few more seconds and confess that God may have mercy on your soul. I've used illegal drugs. I've been drunk. I've had sex out of my own marriage. God forgive me. At this point, I'm going to lead you in a prayer if you raise your hands. Remember, the power does not come in repeating after me. The power comes in your confession and your belief. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, I recognize that I am a sinner. I recognize that I have broken your laws. And because of this, I deserve to go to hell when I die. But right now, I confess, I say from my own mouth that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life. And I believe that you, God, raised Jesus from the dead to save my soul. I know now that I'm saved. And that when I die, I'm going to heaven. But while I'm here on earth, you have a mission for me. Help me to serve you with my life. And help me to remember that because I've been forgiven, I too must forgive. In Jesus' name, amen.